So this was a rather rough UX start, um, but welcome to my talk. And, and today I want to talk to you about how to stay user-centered in a pressure cooker project. And I want to give you five learnings from designing the Dutch COVID passport app. Um, so this is me, I'm Emily. I'm a UX lead and partner at Coase. And I've been working at Coase for over seven years. I have a background uh, in, in industrial design engineering at the T Technical University in Delft. And my mission at SCOS is to make digital life human. Because there are so many services that are fighting for our attention, boost unhealthy screen time. And I think this should be different because I think uh, these services should promote health engagement and safeguard our privacy by default and should be accessible to everyone also by default. So this is my mission at COAST. Um, and then more about COAST. So COAST is a global design innovation agency. And we're based in Amsterdam, Berlin, Oslo, and Lisbon. And with a team, you don't see it completely here, but of around 50 strategists, designers, and researchers, uh, we work for a lot of different industries. So for healthcare, for government, for energy, for education, for a lot of different industries. The common thread of our work is that we always do it with the user focus in mind. So the user is at the heart of digital innovation. And, and this is me in my free time. So I like to spend as less time online when I'm off. I like to be in nature. Uh, just like you, I like to cycle a lot. Um, I like to escape the busy streets of Amsterdam and uh, visit the countryside. I really love snowboarding. I also love working in my garden. I have now a tremendous amount of tomatoes, spinach, and fennel. Um, and I really love art. So I like painting, drawing, and visiting museums. Um, so this is me and a little bit of background in my free time. So yeah, let's talk about the COVID passport app. I think we all have used one and forced. And this is what the Dutch COVID passport looked like. And before we dive into the learnings, I want to give you a little bit of context because it was a really intense project, I must say. It was far from average. So let's go back to uh, now distant and haunting memory because when COVID start, uh, started, we, there was a wave of anxiety and insecurity and deaths because we didn't know where it came from. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know how to fight it. And healthcare professionals worked in tiring shifts trying to cure the infected ones. And we all collectively tried to make the best of this new life, um, this completely new reality. And then when the virus spread faster than we hoped for, complete cities went into complete lockdowns. Restaurants and cafes wanting to open so badly their doors and the cultural sector as well. And then the COVID test became available. And with these tests, uh, restaurants could reopen the door as long as visitors could show a negative test result. But this mandatory uh, testing sparked civil unrest and riots um, in many cities. And this was in the Netherlands, like an entire test street was set on fire because people were angry because they had to test. And the crisis slowly became grimier and complexer. And then vaccines became available. And the uh, enforced safety measures to fight the crisis led to even larger demonstrations and polarization. It was in this tumultuous context that we uh, received our design challenge. Um, and when we received the challenge, the only instrument was the COVID test. So there were no vaccines yet. And our challenge was to build a solution that allows Dutch inhabitants to participate in social events when recently tested negative on Corona. And Hugo, our Dutch Prime Minister of Health, Welfare and Sports added, yeah, an MVP must be live in seven weeks. And we were like, 
damn, this is some challenge. Uh, we were excited on the one hand, because what a challenge for the entire Netherlands, but an entire app in seven weeks for the entire Netherlands. Um, so we expressed our doubts, like, can we do this? But there was no room for trade-offs. It was just, this has to be live in seven weeks because we are in a crisis and we have to make it livable ASAP. And Hugo continued um, to picture his desired solution. So the solution had to be user-centered, had to be user-friendly and simple for all to use. It had to be privacy-friendly, so protect our, uh, protect our data as much as possible. It had to be inclusive, so usable and friendly to 17 million of users with maybe impairments, handicaps. And to add to that, we had to work transparently, so be open how we worked and what steps we made to our entire society. We have a visitor, I think. <laughs> um, to sum up our pressure cooker ingredients, we had to go live in seven weeks from just a vague idea to an MVP that was launched. We were designing in a crisis for a completely new world that was unimaginable, like proving a COVID passport to show you're healthy. This was very new and alien. Um, we had to design for everyone, 70 million of users, and not only you and me, but also people that couldn't hear with motor impairments, with cognitive impairments. Um, so we had to ensure that the solution that was enforced had to be, uh, was friendly and usable to all. The political climate was very turbulent, so there were a lot of demonstrations, polarization, and we were closely watched by journalists. They made sure that our every step was seen by the public eye. So I must say, I think this was the biggest, biggest challenge that I embarked as a digital designer. I'm not that old, but I did quite a lot of projects and this was definitely the hardest one. Um, but we decided to do it, of course. So COS embarked uh, the Corona check team that consisted of um, a lot of disciplines from different agencies. And we joined with a service designer, a colleague of mine, and myself uh, as a UX designer. And yeah, I think this team to me is a startup from heaven because there were all these expertises that are really good at what they're doing. Like the cybersecurity expert and the technical architect, they were true geniuses and the developers were the best I've ever seen. Uh, so we work, were working in crisis, but it was with an A-player team. So that made it really um, special. And at the other hand, we had an advisory board that gave us input, but also new requirements and set deadlines. Um, so yeah, that's what the team looked like. Um, and I want to make a small, oh, I want to make a small sidestep uh, to talk about UX design and surface design, because I think many of you may know these terms, but everybody has different interpretations. I'd just like to uh, clarify a bit how we see it at COAST. So at COAST, we see surface design and UX design as different focuses. So surface design is more zoomed out and UX design is more zoomed in. Um, so if you have a person on one side or maybe a user, if you will, he touches your brand through all the touch points that your brand has. So a help desk, a website, your app, a salesperson, your store. And um, you can desire this entire experience for the entire brand experience. And service design is a holistic approach that orchestrates and tries to improve the entire service experience across different touch points. Um, UX design, like I said, is more zoomed in. It's about designing uh, the best experience at one touch point. And personally, I think service design and UX design is the best combination there is, because without surface design, you would design only like a very good experience at one touch point. So you would have a great app, but if the help desk sucks, then your overall experience is still not good because I think like the entire service experience is as good as the weakest link. Um, so service design is like the best brother of UX design because it allows to ensure 
a user-centric and user-friendly overall experience. Um, these are the five service design principles, and I fully embrace them in, uh, as a UX designer in my way of working. Um, so the five are user-centered. So service design is about thinking and designing from a user perspective. It's holistic. It zooms out to the entire experience. Uh, Co-creation, so by collaborating with different expertises and stakeholders, you can move faster and better as a team because you build up on um, each other's expertises. Uh, from service to core, so you design the optimal experience regarding uh, the requirements there are, and then you drill down to the internal processes, um, like the risk and viability, for instance. And it's an iterative way of working because you don't design all at once. You start small and work to perfection onwards. So this was a little, little theoretical sidestep back to the challenge that we faced. So we faced the challenge of building a solution that allows Dutch inhabitants to participate in social events when recently tested in Corona in seven weeks. And you might think what did your project look like these seven weeks? So this is what a normal project may look like. The innovation scribble is, uh, is shown here. And you start with navigating the chaos. Um, you start researching user needs, the context, you define a problem statement, and you come up with multiple design directions and you de-risk them, like how do the users um, uh, react on it? So you de-risk desirability, you de-risk feasibility and viability. And once the solution is de-risked, you hand it over to development. And let's say this, that this hypothetical project from A to, C, uh, A to Z can easily take up a year. Um, then this is what our project looked like. Uh, because we didn't have any other choice than to work our ass off in parallel. Um, and there were long nights and there were weekend shifts, um, but we did it because in seven weeks, we've designed an accessible app that was understandable. We've user tested it, the usability. Uh, we did a quantitative test um, and the developers developed an app for iOS and Android and we released it to a beta audience, so not to the entire Netherlands, but it was a working app in seven weeks. And the team was super proud, super tired, because we were still in lockdown, so it was really weird. Uh, but we were super proud that we did it. Um, but if you think that we had time to rest, no, because Hugo came back to us. And um, he kept on asking new things because the situation changed overnight and there were no rules and then the vaccines became available. So like the situation kept on changing, 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 changing. So uh, yeah, we had a lot of pressure cookers <laughs> in a row. <laughs> so we started with the app of creating a test certificate app for festivals the vaccines became available and had it to be added in the app. Then we were asked to include other ways to create a certificate, because what if you don't have a smartphone and we have to have an accessible solution? And this was still all to a beta audience, so uh, not to the entire Netherlands. And then overnight, the government decided to roll out to the entire Netherlands uh, and that we had to use this solution to enter restaurants, bars, theaters. Uh, so the app didn't change that much, but the use of the app changed a lot. Um, and then the borders could reopen again so we could travel. So we in the Netherlands had to uh, add an international QR and then boosters came ev became available. So yeah, in this year, the app changed a lot. Uh, we released basically a new uh, app in a month and sometimes even time, multiple times a month. Uh, quite a hectic year. <laughs> um, and this is what the app looked like. Um, so in the Netherlands, we had two different QRs. I think um, you might have had only one QR because in the entire world actually used only one QR the international QR, it's called. And that is quite privacy unfriendly because it contains your full name, your date of birth, 
if you were vaccinated, where you were vaccinated with what vaccine, what date you were vaccinated. So it contains everything. And um, the Netherlands, and I believe also Denmark, were the only countries that were stubborn to create a national QR that would only create, uh, contain... Hmm? Yes or no? Yes or no? Boom. Um, and so like it's a green light, you have a valid certificate. So not if you were tested, vaccinated or recovered. And also only some credentials of your name that were not unique to you that like many people would have. So that's why the Netherlands um, had quite a different uh, solution than other countries. Um, so yeah, this is what it looked like at one stage of the process. The little movie underneath, you think, oh, that's only fun decoration. That was actually to prevent that you would make a screenshot. So scanners would know, hey, it's moving. Um, so this was a safety measure, actually. Um, now let's proceed to the learnings. Um, five learnings, how to stay user-centered in a pressure cooker project. First of all, set the foundation. Establish a strong user-centric team culture even if you don't have much time. We had seven weeks, but it was super important. Uh, because, because like I showed you earlier, we had quite a diverse team with different perspectives. And our technical team members really tended to think from a technical point of view. And they didn't understand the user, uh, the user perspective. And I, they also didn't see the value of doing it. Um, and in our team, we really encouraged to think from a user perspective and to prioritize features and solutions that um, supported user needs. So we actually established a team culture where we placed the user at the center of decision-making. So yeah, you should educate them, educate them about user-centered design, but what really helped is to show them, to invite them to user tests, uh, to learn together. Um, and this was one example in the, in the process I'm going to show you in a bit. But the user story was, I just showed you these two QRs. And when we started, a, a cybersecurity expert said, users shouldn't be allowed to change easily between the QR codes. Because, I'm going to show you the solution, you cannot switch easily because users might accidentally show the international QR containing much more information. And this is unsafe. And we were like, this is really hard for users. We like, I could understand it, but my grandma, no. <laughs> so, but we were in a dilemma. And then the answer sometimes is, yeah, show, don't tell, just make the solution, go test it and see if it fails or not. So that was what we did. We designed it. We invited our entire team to the user test. And then the team heard people saying things like, this is so annoying. This is so cumbersome. Why should it be? this hard and another person didn't notice she had an international QR at all. So then the entire team could really empathize with user needs and they understand that their initial user requirement was not good and that we should go back to the drawing table. So yeah, establish a strong user-centric team culture, um, like help your team to think from a user perspective and also invite them to user tests to learn along and to create this empathy for user needs in your team. And by the way, this is what it eventually looked like. So no big burden to switch, but just a simple tab bar. And you would see immediately that you would have a Dutch and international QR. Um, moving on. So you have this strong team culture but then you want to make sure that you collaborate well with all the other disciplines as a designer, because this is the way that you can secure user centricity all along the process. Um, this is what our sprint rhythm looked like. So we would start with exploring requirements. We would design based on our best designer assumptions. Then we would continue to, we would uh, do some user validation and development, this development in similar, uh, in parallel. It's not ideal because then if you if you come like if you learn that it's not working you have to go back to the drawing board the development is really unhappy um, but yeah if you had your good iteration you had validated the desirability in your user test then we would test and release we would have an immense feedback loop of 70 million Netherlands uh, users 
Netherlands is small, but 70 million users is quite a lot. Um, and we would also receive input from the accessibility, accessibility research team who was researching the code and how user friendly it was and how accessible it was. And every step was tackled with a smaller team of um, or entire team. So for instance, design was tackled by the service designer, UX designer and copywriter. And uh, for testing and release it, uh, releasing, it was testers, developers, and a user designer to see if everything was designed according to plan. Um, and what helped us in collaborating with other disciplines um, is to use, use user-centered design as a common thread, because this secured this user centricity along the process. So we were actually everywhere. We were just curious. Um, hmm? Not in development. No, but like in testing and release, no, we let them do their thing. Yeah. You do you. And we also had to do the user validation. So we, did, we didn't have resources or time, but we were there with testing the code. Like sometimes they saw things differently or they. So. so they design as well, or? No, but with, uh, during re exploring the requirements, they were. Because then we would have actually a pre refinement, like we were showing our designs, like, okay, Great idea, but it's not doable. And so we would really collaborate, yeah. Um, continuing to the third learning. Involve your users often and early in the entire process. So especially in pressure cooker projects, you want to fail fast to succeed sooner. And this is what we did. We did a lot of user tests. In every new sprint, with every new iteration, we made a design. We made a clickable prototype, so no code involved, just a facade, is, as we call it. Show it to users and ask questions like, to which degree do you, do, do you understand it? And how safe do you feel? How does this make you feel? What parts do you don't understand or do you find difficult to use? And in these tests, we gained a lot of uh, understanding for user needs, but also insights for how we could improve the solution. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Volunteers are paid for this. Yeah, paid. Yeah, yeah. We also are user, we use a recruitment agency, so we outsource that, and you, you get just paid. And we have then recruitment specs, like okay, we want also your attitude towards Corona. It should be like a good representation, so we also included anti-vax uh, people, like from all ages. For uh, it differed for the testing, but. Um, in the, in, in the first place, we had 12, but later also sometimes six um, different. Um, so yeah, we did a lot of usability tests in every sprint to um, see where it could be improved uh, in terms of usability, but also in terms of privacy. Um, and only when necessary, we performed quantitative tests to quantify our qualitative insights. So we did this, for instance, before we went live to uh, 17 million users, because then you want to know how often does this count? How, how uh, yeah, so to quantify or qualitative data. And then we learned, for instance, that 82% thought it was easy to use. So then we were confident, and also our advisory board was confident. And 79% gives the apps an eight or higher. So this is the data that you actually want as a team, but also as an advisory board, the government, to go live safely. And uh, we also organized large scale pilots uh, because we were designing a solution with a completely new interaction for a completely new world. So then you want to observe the, uh, the interactions in a real life scenario. So we organized a pilot festival and a football match, and we observed our app in interactions in real life scenarios. And we talked to different users, different stakeholders, and there we learned mainly two things. Um, first of all, the scanning, there were long lines, really long lines. And people were so happy that they could out, go out, go to a festival, they already drank. Um, so there were long lines, both for the festival and for the football match. And why? Because they didn't care about this Corona app at all. They cared about the festival or the match. And they all forgot to keep their identification ready and to keep their app ready. 
So this was one uh, thing that, and that this especially annoyed the stakeholders. So the guy uh, organizing the festival, because they want to safeguard smooth entrance. And also in the city stadium, like he has to use the solution. He doesn't want to use this. So he wanted really to, uh, he was really annoyed in this pilot because he wanted to have a smooth entrance. A second learning was because the scanner person has to check check some credentials when checking and we saw them all like uh, and it took a long time to check so we had to do something about this checking screen and we had to iterate to perfection to make the lives of the scanning persons easier but also to uh, make the stakeholders happy uh, in the end we provided communication materials for events to put in place in lines like hey guys keep your identification ready keep your corona check app ready so it prepared users might be a small tweak, but it helped a lot. Um, so yeah, that was the third learning. Uh, involve your users early and often to learn and to improve your entire overall solution. Moving on to the fourth learning. Integrate accessibility at the core and don't hold it on. Um, because if you want to have a user-centered product, you should embed accessibility uh, throughout the process from the start. Um, and designing for accessibility is about ensuring that your product is usable and user-friendly by a wide variety of people, regardless of any limitations or impairments. Um, and a colleague once told me, accessibility is like a blueberry muffin. After it's baked, you cannot add the blueberries. You should incorporate them from the start. Um, and it, I think it's a good analogy. <laughs> so this is what the app design looked like. Um, so we prioritized accessibility for different screen sizes, for different uh, font sizes, and also we ensure to have a sufficient color contrast. And then developers labeled all elements meticulously, so people with motor and cognitive impairments could use features like voiceover and screen readers. Because if you don't do it, your app is read out completely wrong. Um, so design and developers uh, did their thing. Um, and after releasing a new version, uh, we conducted accessibility tests to see if we did it well. And we did this with people with various impairments. So here you see Natanya, she's blind. And uh, above we have people with uh, motor impairments. Um, so yeah, we tested our solution and gave a lot of um, ways to improve the app to make it more accessible. And now let's memorize this blueberry muffin, because if we didn't came up with this uh, good design system and a proper coding from the start, we had to throw everything after seven weeks in the bin and start over. And now we could just make some small tweaks to um, and continue and keep the pace. Um, but it's not, about, uh, not about only about designing an app, because if you design for all, it automatically means offering multiple solutions. Because what if you don't have a uh, smartphone? Or what if you cannot uh, comprehend this solution? Um, so in, in order to design for accessibility, you have to offer multiple uses, usage options. Uh, so ultimately, we came up with the Quorum che Check app, the scanner app to scan it, the QR code, but also for uh, uh, with a web portal where people could make a paper proof if you don't have a smartphone, but also with a phone line. So you could just call and some questions were asked to you and you would receive this paper certificate by post. Uh, and this was addressing people with age or cognitive limitations. So design multiple options um, if you want to design for accessibility but then also access the entire ecosystem. Uh, because um, we assessed actually every touch point, but also stakeholder in the ecosystem. And this brought us to delivering communication input for the government to say the right things, because we learned so much during these usability tests. Uh, so this improved the overall communication. Uh, we wrote help desk script. So if people would call and didn't understand the usage, they could help the people in the best possible way. Uh, we came up with movie instructions for low literate people to explain the solution. 
Um, and what I told you earlier, communications as input for locations. So by designing multiple options, but also in assessing the entire ecosystem, you can come up with a user-friendly solution uh, that's, that is accessible to all. Last learning. Don't uh, stay with me, guys. <laughs> and be pragmatic when designing for implementation. Because we noticed that we had really user-friendly and feasible solutions, but sometimes when we drill down to the core, they were not as security friendly or privacy friendly, or they limited to the technical architecture, or they were not so flexible because it uh, costed development a lot of time to develop, but yeah, uh, we couldn't use it flexibly elsewhere. So we learned in this project that uh, we had to be pragmatic in a pressure cooker. And sometimes you have to give in a little on user centricity to keep the pace uh, and to tweak the uh, solution a little. And we as designers, what helped us a lot is uh, because we get to learn the bandwidth of our solution better. Um, and we learned that there was a huge need for flexibility because the changes kept on coming. The context kept on changing. So that's why we created a very flexible design system. Sorry, it's in Dutch, but it's not about the text. It's just about the elements. Uh, but, but this the flexible design system allowed us to make changes overnight and also to uh, save development time. That was really uh, valuable. Uh, so we just had a simple card for in the Netherlands and uh, internationally. We had a banner to announce changes. Uh, was quite frequently. Um, yeah, and this allowed us to make changes flexibly. So you can forget my entire talk. Um, as long as you remember these five things, if you want to secure user centricity in your pressure cooker projects. Firstly, establish a strong user-centric team culture, collaborate cross-functionally, uh, cross and as a designer, be everywhere, be a spider in the web, involve users early and often, integrate accessibility at the core and don't bolt it on, remember Blue Bear Muffin, and be pragmatic when designing for implementation. Thank you. Any questions? Is it so clear? <laughs> Last slide. Oh. <laughs> oh, so just picture material. <laughs> So how long holiday did you take after this project? <laughs> oh, I'm oh, sorry for the one to know. Yeah, uh, it was quite tiring. Uh, and, that, and that you feel after you um, stepped off the project. Because at first it was quite nice because we were in lockdown and for everybody, life was so crazy. Uh, and then it, was, it felt in some way also nice to be at the forefront. To, to fight it, or to, at least you think, <laughs> you thought, yeah. Uh, so you think to, to be able to fight it, and it was quite exciting to work with the government, of course. Uh, but then when you step out of it, you felt, yeah, this was actually quite tiring. Uh, so yeah, it took some time off. <laughs> Excellent presentation. And I get a question about how many people were involved in the testing? I mean, uh, with the people doing the a festival and, and a match, uh, how huge was a group of researchers, but also how many people you, you tested during the, the, the days? A very good question. There were multiple teams. So actually, the government, like in fighting the crisis, they set up multiple teams. So you also had a research team that performed a lot of research uh, also in the ecosystem. and. We were there like the Corona check team. You also had the GGD team and you had, you had different teams. So you just uh, came up with a lot of teams to fight the crisis. And in this uh, festival, for instance, we noticed there was another research team researching different things than we did. So we were specifically interested in the improving the interaction. Uh, but I know in the football match, there were so many tests. There were even like, um, FACA? Like um, a field slots, like in the field, that people would wave with like big hands to see if Corona would spread faster, and <laughs> thing with like uh, scarves. 
So they came up with a lot of tests to see if this solution was safe, could, could safeguard safe entrance. So to answer your question, I know that there are more teams. I don't know how many. I know that we were with like uh, three researching the uh, Corona check app. <laughs> Actually, just brings obviously the pressure cooker environment and that you're getting user feedback at the same time as development. Yeah. In an ideal sense, or in a mm -hmm. you know, long uh, pandemic, would you structure your sprints so that you've got sort of the, the design and testing and development and yeah. kind of flow a bit differently? Yeah, and uh, it, it depends on the project. It depends is never a good, nice answer, but, yeah. but especially when the requirements are so insecure because the world was so new. So you don't also don't feel what requirements make sense. Yeah. So for instance, with this example of not sh like making it hard to switch between a Dutch QR and a national QR, it was just based on the assumptions of a cybersecurity expert. So in this case, you especially want to have de-risk desirability prior to get, handing over to development. Because now they they sometimes had like really tiring shifts to make our best solution, build upon our assumption. And then, oh, look, you should think to this, let's go back to the drawing board. And uh, yeah, but what we did, it was, uh, we really had a strong team sense. So that we all know we're in the same boat. Yeah, so I think ideal is to make your big, big, their risk, the biggest parts prior to hand over to development. That's uh, like some small tweaks are okay, but not the entire solution. Yeah, especially when the requirements are still evolving. Exactly, yeah, yeah. On that note, yeah. I'm interested given it was such a high pressure, high velocity. How did you extend that culture that worked you to the stakeholders, people that were blockers, people that might have been blockers? How did you convince them to what you were doing to drive it to get out You mean like, uh, for instance, advisory board stakeholders? Yeah, advisory board, policy holders, people that tend to sort of think that we need to do this. Yeah. First of all, I think we were in a good position because uh, the ministry actually. They had like these four pillars, so they want to have a user-friendly option that was accessible, that was privacy-friendly. So we were actually, I've, I have been starting in worse positions, so they already, yeah. <laughs> but I, what really helped is organizing demos. It was not in this talk, there's much more to tell, but we organized demos quite frequently to um, government, like, okay, this solution uh, looks like this, and users tell this and that about it. Um, sometimes we even, like, at important points, we added quantitative data. 80% thinks this is easy to use. So if you see these quotes and this quantitative data, uh, this really helps with convincing your stakeholders, even if they don't believe. It takes a while, but... <laughs> Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> 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 we just have another round of applause for you. Uh,